Hello and welcome to my dorm. Today I'm going to be talking about electrochemical machining. Electrochemical machining is an extremely approachable method for amateurs to manufacture custom aluminum parts by retrofitting their own 3D printers. Electrochemical machining allows anyone with salt water and a computer power supply to drill holes, machine objects, and later on even engrave. ECM is extremely variable. You can drill holes from 3 millimeters wide down to even a few microns wide. For a long time, I've been searching for a method to create aluminum parts, and I've yet to figure out how to 3D print aluminum, though not for lack of trying. About a year ago, I found the next best thing, ECM. ECM is not like regular CNC machining, and it's not like the much more well-known EDM, electrical discharge machining. ECM generates no noise and no heat. ECM costs almost nothing to get started with. What I have here is a bracket that I fabricated using ECM. It consists of two aluminum plates, which I've drilled holes through using a three millimeter electrode. Then I 3D printed a bracket to go in between them and I used M3 machine screws to hold everything together. You can really see the possibilities here of combining 3D printing with 2D parts that were created using ECM. Let's talk about how all of this works. Electrochemical machining relies on two electrodes, a cathode, which is attached to our positive voltage, and an anode, which is attached to ground. For the sake of drilling and milling, I'm using a 12 volt power supply from a computer. It's very important that the cathode be hollow, that way we can pump electrolyte through it. The electrolyte is composed of a solution of sodium chloride. When we apply a voltage, electrolysis is going to occur. This means that aluminum metal is going to be converted to aluminum hydroxide and hydrogen gas when it reacts with water. The aluminum hydroxide is insoluble in water, and so it's going to precipitate out as a white fluffy gel that's going to be washed away and collected in our waste bucket. The pump is continuously pumping salt water from our waste bucket back to the electrode. As we move the electrode closer and closer to the aluminum, more and more material is going to remove until we've made a negative of our tool in our work. If we continue this process over and over again, dissolving material and then slowly moving our electrode down, eventually we'll drill entirely through the material. If we drill a small area down and then move our electrode horizontally or laterally, then we can mill out material. However, this process is very slow. We have to go only a few microns at a time. I've experimented with concentration and found out the more concentrated the solution of salt, the wider the hole you're going to drill will be. So if you want precision, then you'll want to use a very dilute solution of sodium chloride, approximately 5% by weight. However, if you want to increase the size of the hole you're drilling, then you can either increase the diameter of your electrode, or you can increase the concentration to upwards of 14% by weight. The chemistry governing this process is relatively simple. Aluminum, which is our workpiece, loses three electrons. This means that it has a positive three charge and enters into solution. Water is electrolyzed. It gains two electrons and is broken up into protons and hydroxyl ions. If we have two water molecules and they pick up two electrons, then we're left with two protons and two hydroxyl ions. The protons have a positive one charge and the hydroxyl ions each have a negative one charge. They're extremely reactive. So the protons will immediately go on to grab an electron each and form hydrogen gas, which leaves as a, as a gas and bubbles out a solution. Now the aluminum ions, which have a positive three charge, will react with three hydroxyl ions. Each has a negative one charge, so they balance out. So we have an ionic bond that's formed, and now we have aluminum hydroxide. Aluminum hydroxide is extremely insoluble in water, so it's going to precipitate as a white fluffy gel and be washed away. So what we've essentially done is gotten rid of our aluminum metal and then washed it away in the form of aluminum hydroxide. During this process, we use six electrons to break up three molecules of water. 
and we also gained three electrons when we oxidize aluminum. So the net result is that we've used up three electrons. We have three electrons less than when we started, and that's why we have to apply current. That's why this process requires electricity, is because we need to supply those three electrons for this chemical reaction to occur. Nikola Tesla had a quote that just a little bit of theory and calculation can save us 90% of our effort. So let's consider the math behind all of this. Faraday's law of electrolysis tells us that the mass of material we remove from the anode is equivalent to the current, the time, and the molar mass of whatever element we're trying to get rid of, divided by Faraday's constant multiplied by the number of valence electrons. That's just the amount of electrons in the outer shell of our element. Now that just so happens to be the amount of electrons we need that I showed on the previous slide. So for aluminum, that's three electrons. Aluminum has three valence electrons. When we plug in everything for aluminum, we find that the grams of material we remove from our work is equal to the amps that we pass through the system in a period of one second times 27 grams per mole for aluminum divided by Faraday's constant times three. Now the only things that we can vary in this equation that we have control over is the amps, which is the current, and the time in seconds here. So if we want to remove more material, we can either increase the amount of time we're over a given region, or we can increase the current. To increase the amount of time we're over a given region, all we have to do is slow down the machine. So we can change the feed rate in the G-code. So if we want to spend twice as much time over, over a region and remove twice as much material, then all we have to do is drop the feed rate by half. I found that for drilling, you need a Z feed rate of approximately 3.6 millimeters per minute maximum. Uh, you can change that. And what I found is that as you decrease the speed, the diameter of the hole also increases. So that gives you another tool for varying the size of your cuts. And you can actually create chambers, I would imagine, inside your part by going slower through the center and then speeding up as you go through the end. So you, you can remove more material from the center. So that's something you can think about. Uh, you can also increase the current. Uh, you can increase the current by increasing voltage, which assists via dual heating, uh, or you can increase the concentration of your electrolyte, which reduces resistance of that liquid. You can also, to increase current, reduce the inner electrode gap. That's the distance between your electrodes. Uh, however, if you go too small, you risk uh, the chance of you shorting the whole system. I mentioned before that we can shrink all this down and create features that are just a couple microns across. This is made possible by Jet ECM. Jet ECM is the exact same process as regular ECM, except that we're using a much higher pressure electrolyte, uh, a much smaller diameter electrode, and we're using higher voltage. The electrolyte exits the electrode, in this case a 34 gauge needle, at a very high velocity. And because of that, when it hits the aluminum, it's in a laminar flow. And so the area around this uh, cutting region, you can think of as having a uniform layer of fluid across it. And because it's coming out at such a great velocity, it very rapidly uh, pushes away any material that it etches. So we have a continuously clean area around our cutting region. It's important to keep in mind that your electrolyte has to be clean when you're doing this. Uh, any particulate will clog this whole system. So we need a much higher voltage because we have to make up for the fact that our cross-sectional area of our electrode is so low and we have generally a slightly larger inner electrode gap. I've experimented and this will work anywhere from between 3 millimeters to like 0.2 millimeters. So having a higher voltage uh, allows us to heat this region uh, by dual heating, so the electrolyte is pretty warm when it comes out of here, nearly boiling in some cases. 
and that, that reduces the resistance of the electrolyte and allows it to draw more current and we can do more work. When you are spraying this electrolyte out and it's very hot and conductive, you can etch away quite a bit of material. The aspect ratio uh, can be relatively high. We can also use Jet ECM to engrave images. I wrote a Python script that generates G code from an image that you input. All you have to do is give it start locations in the form of X and Y and Z coordinates and the resolution that you are operating at, which is the diameter of your electrode. The Python script works by taking an image and converting it to an array using OpenCV, and it also converts it to black and white while it's doing this. So when we have an array, that's a series of pixels. So when we pull out the, the first sequence of numbers in the array, it's going to be the first row, and then you do it for the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and so on, however many rows your image has. What we do is vary the feed rate uh, of the electrode as we move. So our feed rate is going to be very slow over pixels that we want to be dark, because we want to remove more material, and by removing more material, we're creating a trench for light to get trapped in. As we raster the image, we carve one row of pixels out, then we go back to the next starting point, then we carve more pixels out, and we keep repeating this process so that we get an image. And the result is quite stunning. I'm, I'm quite proud of it. One thing that you could do in theory is label all the parts you make with something like a serial number. Another thing that I'm very interested in is making microfluidic circuits. So I've been experimenting with some traces here. And the idea is that you put uh, a gasket over this essentially and you can use these little channels you make as pipes to control the, the flow of liquid. And there, there are some interesting technologies that use that. The G-code for these was generated using Inkscape. Uh, Inkscape has a laser engraving function that works pretty well for this as long as you set the start Z coordinates in the beginning of the code. For the electrode for Jet ECM, hypodermic syringes work pretty well and these are, these are very cheap. You can get a packet of 100 of these for something like $10. Uh, these work really well especially for rastering an image and research has shown for Jet ECM that some that shapes that are like a hypodermic needle where you have a cut tip at an angle that actually improves the cutting efficiency you're, you're cutting deeper trenches when you use that shape before I go I'd like to give up some technical details the inner electrode gap that's the distance between our electrodes uh, will vary depending on what you want to accomplish I found that somewhere between 0.4 and 0.1 millimeters works best, so it's important to make sure that the surface is level or you're using some sort of auto tramming feature. The feed rate is 3.6 millimeters per minute for the z-axis, but 25 millimeters per minute for the x and y axis. Uh, in addition, you'll want a plunge rate uh, when you're doing milling of about 0.025 millimeters, which is just on the lower limit of what 3D printers can accomplish when you retrofit your own 3D printer with an ECM head. Insulation, uh, you want to make sure the tool head is insulated, that way only the bottom of the electrode is active. This helps improve precision. Uh, heat shrink tubing works excellent for this. Just make sure that it's cut flush. For G-code generation, I found Inkscape is very useful for simple things like milling and engraving. However, you'll want to hand write G-code for drilling or use Python that I wrote. I'll put links to the GitHub down in the description. You'll have to figure out the code, and I wouldn't recommend approaching it unless you knew Python. Uh, Python is relatively friendly, and it's pretty easy to get into. You should be able to plug in values for your own printers 
uh, parameters into my script and get it to work and be able to drill. Uh, if you don't know Python, don't worry. You can just handwrite G code very easily. You just tell your printer to go to an XY coordinate and then move down very slowly. And that's all there is to drilling. But you'll need uh, Inkscape for milling. And if you want to create very, very complex drilling patterns, like if you wanted to make like a honeycomb, then you probably want to use the Python script. Well, that's everything.